fat. Turn this on, skip. Make sure the mic's set. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I think we're good. Ready to go. All right, you sound good. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. We got another state of the program edition, and this is one of those programs that I feel like we can never talk enough about, even though the results on the field don't exactly merit that. <laughs> but they're endlessly interesting. So we bring in our tech expert, Sam Kahn Jr., who wrote the Texas Longhorn state of the program story that you can read right now on The Athletic. And if you're not already subscribed, I mean, come on. Dollar a month for your first six months. Go to theathletic.com slash Andy Staples or just click on Sam's story and subscribe through there. That's the way you do it. Sam, is Texas back? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't even do it with a straight face. But this is a fascinating situation, though. Coming off five and seven, Steve Sarkeesian's second season, Quinn Ewers, the, the quarterback who was promised, who then went away, and now he's back. How is this going to work? I really don't know until I see what they look like in the trenches. That's the thing is for all the toys they have with Quinn Ewers and Xavier Worthy, and they brought in Isaiah Nayer, and you know, they've got Jatavian Sanders, who's going to should step up as a really appealing tight end, former five-star prospect. B. John Robinson. B. John Robinson. I forgot about the best offensive I mean, player they have, the best player we, they have, period. Oh, and that's the thing. Like, they're, they're tailbacks. They probably got three that would start for anybody. Yes. Yeah. So, Honestly, maybe four. Jonathan Brooks, their, their redshirt freshman or sophomore, I guess he will be. Gosh, when he gets the ball, he runs well, too. So they are they have got a ton of skill talent. That's talking to coaches around the league is everybody loves their skill talent. But the question is, and, and, and other coaches have the question, too, is what are they going to look like up front? Because they struggled there during their six-game losing streak last year, and they've got all these freshmen coming in. And I asked Sark, how many freshmen are you okay starting? Are you okay starting two freshmen on the line if you have to? And he said, yeah, he's he's okay doing that. So that can be a tricky proposition. It can it can lead – we saw A&M last year. They they struggled early on with that mm -hmm. against Arkansas and Mississippi State. But then, you know, Bryce Foster and Ruben Fathery really found a groove and they finished the season – or at least they got into a groove in the middle of the season. Yeah, and once they got it locked in, it felt like Texas A&M was a, was a different team up front. And, but it's a treacherous yeah. to do freshman offensive linemen to throw them up. It is. And, and the other thing about Texas A&M last year – was they did have a first rounder on their offensive line. Mm -hmm. Texas probably not accused of that, at least with the guys <laughs> that are done. Now, Campbell coming in, the true freshman that everybody loves, and I saw him at a camp and just he's Start. he's a he's a dude. Um, but true freshman. And a lot of these true freshmen are junior enrollees, unlike the you know, a lot of the ones that you like. If you have an offensive lineman who who you expect to play some as a freshman, most of them are coming in in January. That's not the case with these guys. Yeah, only one, Cole Hudson, who who looked good, and and yeah. I saw him in the spring game. I was impressed, but only he was the only one of the seven that that came in, and it's not like they pulled a lot of linemen out of the portal or anything. So that that to me is going to be the big question mark, and, and Alabama is going to be a barometer for that. And nobody's expecting them to win that game, but I'm curious to see how they look there, and then also on the defensive line and, and defensive and a linebacker. What do they look like stopping the run? That that was something that they really, really struggled with last year. You know, giving up 300 rushing yards to Arkansas, 300 to, to Oklahoma. They gave up 200 or more six times. I mean, they, they've got to get better both up front. They've got to play better. The returnees got to play better, and they got to do better fitting gaps, you know, at the back or on the second level. So how much did that collapse against Oklahoma affect last season? Because it felt like everything was going okay up until then. Mm -hmm. The Arkansas game wasn't great, but you know that was a good Arkansas team. That environment was crazy. You can you can write that off as a one off, except it just started happening again. Yeah, I, I think it really did set them back because if you would have asked me, and I think we said it. I think me and Chris Fanini and I think Max. It was either Max or Ari. I can't remember who was all at Red River, but we did a pod after that, and I think we all agreed that it was very possible to see a rematch in the Big 12 championship between Oklahoma and Texas after we saw them that day. I mean, they were up by 18 points. Yeah. In in the in the second half of that game. And the you I mean, you guys, everybody saw it. The way Bijan played, the the explosiveness downfield you saw from Worthy, you just saw the tools of a team that played at a high, high level. And then the collapse down the stretch, and then it became a thing. Then they collapsed down the stretch against Oklahoma. Then they collapsed down the stretch against Baylor. Double-digit leads in the second half of all of them. 
they struggled mightily against Iowa State. They never even really led uh, by very much in that game. And uh, Sark seemed to think it was a lot of it was psyche and a lot of it was mental. So, this is uh, he said he told you something that I, I'm I'm fascinated by. This is the first time I think in the history of college football that a coach blamed their fancy new football facility <laughs> on why they stunk. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. I, I heard him talk about that at uh, he came to Houston in May, uh, one of the you know rubber chicken tour, speak to the alumni and all that, and he talked about that. And it was inter- It was interesting to listen to, and I understood what he was saying is that they weren't together enough because they physically weren't together enough, and so that when push came to shove in midseason, that they probably weren't together as they needed to be to get through some of those struggles. I think there's more to it than that. I think a lot of it, when you look at 35 new players on the roster, it's clearly more than that. It's personnel too. And I think the performance in, on the line of scrimmage would tell you that, but it was fascinating to hear that. It was certainly fascinating to hear that, uh, yeah, that spin on it. Cause they were, they were kind of separated because they were doing construction and now that's all done. They've got they're they're together again. And, uh, so they and have been together this whole off season. So you got a lot of best off season ever. We're closer than ever. <laughs> cliche vibes coming from the Longhorns. Which, listen, if they if they play like that, then we'll believe it. But mm-hmm. we, we got it. I I've got to the point with Texas Sam where I just don't believe anything that comes out of their mouths. Yeah, you, they're very much in a you have to prove it to me. You have to show it to me at this point. That that's where they are. We we have to see it to believe it. We've been. They've been ranked in the top 25 preseason too many times. We've heard that Texas is back too many times. Uh, They're very much in a they have to show the tangible evidence at this Mm -hmm. point for us to buy in, I think. And that's justifiable. I mean, they've had one double-digit win season since 2009. Uh, And it was in in 2018 when they went to the Sugar Bowl. So Baylor has been a much better program than them over the last decade. You know, Yeah, and and I'm sure that drives them crazy. It's not... Because like Oklahoma, you get it. Oklahoma is always good. But the fact that Baylor has been so consistent, the fact that Iowa State the last five years has been consistently good. Uh, Oklahoma State has been consistently good. Like there's just not there's not that consistency at Texas. And I still struggle to pinpoint what exactly is wrong because I watched Charlie Strong succeed at Louisville. He's not a terrible coach. Tom Herman did not do that badly at Texas. It just wasn't up to what they want. But then the, the, they bring in Steve Sarkeesian, who does worse. So I don't, I don't know if it's the coach, the place, combination of, of, of all of it. But I do. The, the longer we get away from Mac Brown, the more I think Mac Brown was just the perfect guy for that place. And even he couldn't keep it together, you know, indefinitely. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to handle in that job, and, and Mac did it so masterfully. Uh, you know, both from a recruiting and a roster standpoint, but also from a handling the public facing part of the job. He's he's terrific at that, and, and he did that. He did that really, really well. You know, I think part of it is you know everybody talks about the the influence from the boosters and all. I think there's something to that, but I also think, and this is not my opinion, but this is just from talking to people who have been in the state for a long time, have recruited the state for a long time. There, There's a running theory amongst coaches across the state that a Texas attracts a certain type of player. And maybe that player is not built or driven to, to push and to succeed at a level that some of these other programs are. I don't know if that's true or not. I think would, it's would, I, would, the te- would the Texan, the old school Texan phrase for that be all hat, no cattle. Maybe uh, I think so. No steak. Yeah, (laughs) that's the, you know, I think, I think there's a, the way it's it's been put to me is that I think that sometimes when you get to Texas because of its reputation and history, you've arrived, you've arrived. That's the, that's it. Is that that players kind of think they've arrived and, you know, Moro Ojimo kind of alluded to this Mm -hmm. is that guys are focused on, you know, what they're, what's going on there in Austin or what's going on in their lives and what's going on in their NIL deals right now, as opposed to what is in the future, if they do what they should and they get into the draft. And so I think he alluded to some of that 
from a culture standpoint. And I think a lot of coaches that I've talked to and people who have recruited this state for a long time and know the landscape of this state ha have said that it just seems like they attract a certain type of player. Well, and Moro is interesting. So if you haven't listened, it, there's a, I did an episode with Omar Richardson from Orange Bloods where we went over Moro's comments and, and Steve Sarkeesian's response to them a couple months ago. One of the things Moro pointed out that I thought was really interesting and really astute was he said, you know, you hear guys talking about what they're going to do when they get to the league. And, and, he's, and he says, and I'm like, and this is Moro talking. I'm like, look at who's getting to the league. Like who's getting to the league from here. Right. There's just not. And that's, that's the other piece of it is. And I think you're the theory that you're talking about makes sense because you do have that sense of, Oh, I'm at Texas. I'm here. I've, I've, I've done what I need to do. Whereas a guy gets to Alabama or a guy gets to Georgia or Ohio state, they don't necessarily feel that way. And, and we, we could talk about Texans leaving and going in other places. Uh, two prime examples, uh, Jeff Okuda mm -hmm. and Jackson Smith and Jigba, who Texans who went to Ohio state, Garrett Wilson who, did too. Not in, who did not immediately become superstars there. Mm -hmm. Like they had to work to get to where they were going mm -hmm. to become a starter at Ohio state and now Okuda was the number three pick in the draft and Jackson Smith and Jigma might be the best receiver in the country. Yeah. And you're, you're right about the, the fact that Texas hasn't had a ton of draft picks. They didn't have any this year and hasn't done well in the draft certainly hurts because I think Morrow made that point is at a place like Alabama or at a place like Ohio state, because they produce those pros at a certain level and they win at a certain level, there's an understanding that when a freshman arrives, this is how it's done. They also know and, what it takes. Like right. the, that, that guy, whoever that is, whether it's like Jonathan Allen coming back to Alabama and visiting or Dalvin Tomlinson or something like that can tell the young person, okay, you think you're hot stuff, but here's all I had to do to get there. Who can, who can go back to Texas and tell anybody that right now? Yeah, there's nobody there. I mean, the again, the last double digit one season was in 2018, and that that's the only one in the last 12 years. So there's no example of, of somebody on the rush. Now, Sark has brought in some transfers, obviously from Alabama, that that I think he hoped would who were not considered <laughs> the most exemplary Alabama football players. Otherwise, they'd still be at Alabama. Right, but but that that's I think part of his hope. It's also you know he also brought in. Ovia Gofo from Notre Dame last year that again from a program that you hope to mimic the culture so but that that it doesn't happen overnight and it takes time and I that's the thing is it's very like we get back to the original point is you have to see it to believe it at Texas at this point is yeah and and, it, and it's interesting because the, the, they're also doing it like Diamante Tucker Dorsey coming from James Madison you, you may laugh when I say James Madison, but that's a winning program. Mm -hmm. Like they, they know what it takes to win games there. It's mm -hmm. a different level, obviously. But if you have a very productive player from a winning atmosphere, you'd kind of need that. Yeah, no, that, there's that no helps. Doubt. There's no doubt because if you have to learn how to win, you have to learn how to win. And, and if, if you're not getting it done, you've got to learn it from people who have. And, that's that's the challenging part of it is you know because the talent accumulation has never been a question like they've, they've always recruit ranked ranked highly in the recruiting rankings to texas even this year and then even in the herman era in the charlie strong era they've always have but they've not been able to translate it on the field and then also i think part of it too has just been retention development certainly you know we look at five and seven last year and a lot of that i look at the 2019 class that that was signed under herman I think I went through it here in this uh, in the state of the program. There was of the 26 guys that they signed in that class, which ranked number three in the country. It was the number three recruiting class in the country. They signed 26 players. 16 have transferred out, three medically retired. One has completed his eligibility. And only six are still on campus. That should be the group that's in their wow. fourth year now. So only yeah. six of those guys in that number three class wow. are still around. That is crazy. And that, so you're going to miss in recruiting, but that is a egregious. Yeah. You can't have a disastrous class like that. And, and, yeah. that, it, and the history of college football tells you that you have like Tennessee's had a, a couple classes like that, where you think it's going to be great. 
you wind up losing everybody and and then you're you're in a hole and that's that it is it is the hole that that sark has been hired to get them out of now the the other thing that looms over all this and this is not a this is not a this season thing this is not a, anything that the players on the roster right now need to be worrying about but probably something sark needs to be worrying about and and chris del the athletic director need to be worrying about the sec is coming you know they're going to be in the sec sooner rather than later you know 2025 at the latest we know that those new Big 12 teams are going to be in the Big 12 2023. We know the SEC's new TV deal starts 2024. So I'm not completely sold on the possibility of them going all the way to 2025 before they join. I, I think there's a chance that, that it happens sooner than that. Alabama is going to be quite the litmus test because, yeah, they're they're going to be. I mean, Alabama may be the best team in the country this year, and the best, and certainly the best team in the SEC. But Georgia is going to look like that and be like that. LSU is going to look like that a lot of the time. Oklahoma is going to be in the SEC with you, so you still got to deal with them. And oh, by the way, there's a team in College Station that the Longhorns still like to laugh at because they're they're only going eight and four in the SEC, but their roster looks a lot different than Texas's roster. Buddy, when you go to practice and you look at the body types and what AM looks like, it looks different. It looks yeah. a lot different than it did five, six years ago. I can promise you that. And they're, they're starting to look more like Alabama or LSU looks on the practice field. So that's where Texas has to get. And that's where I think the, the hiring of Sarkeesian was strategic and probably smart because he's been at Alabama. He knows what it looks like. And he knows what those body types look like. And so you, this class that they just recruited 15 guys in the line of scrimmage, eight defensive mm -hmm. linemen, seven offensive linemen. I think that's probably where you need to be. If you're Texas, if you're preparing for this in two or three years, that's how you need to be recruiting. And of those high end body types that have bursts that, that are, that, that are the high end guys that you're going to need to win because it's not, it's not even just that Alabama has those guys up front. It's that the depth that they have. And, yes. and to compete at that level. And AM learned this from moving to the SEC because that, the that first way. year, yeah. that first year they went 11 and 2. They had a great, all those first round draft picks on the offensive line. It, and then they had a solid defensive front. But then once you got past that first 22, it was not the same. And, and they learned and they struggled through that for years because it took time to build the roster to an SEC style team. And that's the same thing with Texas, where that lead in of two, three years is going to help them. If it isn't, it ends up being that long. Yeah. That's going to help them as long as they can continue to recruit linemen and, and, and big guys, big, long, fast guys at that level. Well, and that, that's the thing. I think the, the way they handled the recruiting class this year was, was smart and they did it right. But I think if you're Sark, you have to avoid disaster this season mm -hmm. because you need to be able to, to bring those guys along. Like, you know, you don't want to have you sign those people for somebody else to come in and do this. And that's the part I worry about with Texas right now, because they do have the skill talent. But even if these linemen that they signed are really good. You shouldn't be relying on them now. Like they're probably not going to, for the most part, contribute until next season, until 2023. So you got to get through 2022. And I know nobody in Texas wants to hear that. Like you got to get through 2022. I know you want to think you're going to compete for the Big 12 title. And maybe you will because you got that skill talent. But I just, I don't trust them against a Baylor or an Oklahoma. Yeah, at this point, no. Especially Baylor right now. We talked about line of scrimmage. Baylor brings back four or five stars in the offensive line and the entire two deep on the defensive line. So... Who, do, who does Texas have that, that compares to Apuica? <laughs> who does Texas have that can block Apuica? Yeah, that's uh that's that's I, I don't have an answer for you on that. It's they they don't have they don't have a guy that looks like that. And their defense obviously is still a different style, but right. they do not have a guy that looks like that or but is that's, a force like that. The SEC's loaded with dudes like that. In fact, he was one of them. Mm -hmm. And then he left LSU. So that's what you that's what you are going to have to learn to deal with and have on your roster. So, you know, that that's the part I want to see how they handle because Sam, you and I were talking about this before we started recording. This is a, a conversation Ari and I often have, but I feel like it's about USC, where 
they've got these skilled guys, you know, I, I, our USC signed the two most impactful transfers of this offseason. Maybe Jameer Gibbs is going from Georgia Tech to Alabama, but but Caleb Williams and 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 Brendan Marion. I'm oh, sorry, Brendan Brendan Marion is Texas receivers coach. He coached <laughs> Jordan Addison at Pittsburgh <laughs> last year. Jordan Addison is the guy I'm talking about who won the Blitnikoff. Um, so Caleb Williams and, and Jordan Addison, probably the two most impactful quarterback and receiver transfers out there. They got him at USC, but they didn't really do much to improve the line of scrimmage. Texas, same thing. They got some players, Isaiah Nair, Jaleel Billingsley, Jai Hall, to improve an already really good skill group. Quinn Ewers comes in as a transfer. I it's I almost don't even look at Quinn Ewers as a transfer. I feel like he went to Ohio <laughs> State because Texas, the state of Texas wouldn't let him do an NIL deal. Secure the bag. Yeah. Yeah, he couldn't do an NIL deal as a high schooler, so he went to Ohio State, did his NIL deals, realized C.J. Stroud is definitely not getting beaten out this year, and mm. left. So that part we get. But can Texas protect whoever, whether it's him or Hudson Card playing quarterback? Can they give him time to throw to Xavier Worthy? Can they give B. John Robinson holes to run through? That's the part I worry about the most. That's the question, and that that is the biggest question. They and, and I I thought as a run blocking group I thought they were solid, but it was it was the pass pro that they really struggled with last year, especially when you look at the second half of that Oklahoma game, where everything started. They really had issues blocking the Nick Benitos of the world mm -hmm. to you know and keeping them off of Casey Thompson, and th that to me is where and, and left tackle is one of the undecided things on this on this team is that you know christian jones who played left tackle last year moving to right tackle so they've got to figure out who's going to start there is it going to end up being a freshman is it going to be one of the returning younger guys that, that's playing so th that's a big question the other thing is is because sark is sark's passing game is so built on downfield you know being effective downfield and they were we saw the all the big passes to worthy but I want to look this up. They only completed 35.7% of attempts that traveled at least 15 yards. That was 105th nationally. So they've got to get better throwing. Yeah, and, and a lot of that is time because right. if you want to throw the ball far down the field, you have to give the receiver a chance to get there, and, yep. and which means you have to give the quarterback some time to throw. So that that is absolutely a factor. Uh, the Quinn Ewers thing – how close are we? What's it going to be? Or is this going to go kind of to the the season opener where Sark plays it close to the vest and and doesn't tell us who the starting quarterback is going to be? Could they play play them both against Louisiana Monroe? How, how's it going to work? I so it it certainly sounds like Sark's dropping crumbs that he's going to decide earlier. He he mentioned that in May when he came to Houston that he that they're ahead of schedule at the position and that he would like to make his decision sooner rather than later. So. Definitely seems to be the idea that he's dropping crumbs that that it's going to happen a little quicker than it did last year, which was basically the third week of training camp last year. Mm -hmm. I still think there's a possibility he plays both early on because of what awaits in week two. Uh, I, I I would not be stunned if he said if he handled it in a similar way that he did last year, where he says, "Well, Hudson's going to start, but Quinn's going to play," and does that for the first two games. They he did the same thing with Hudson Card, Casey Thompson last year and then see what happens in week two against Alabama, and then, you know, week three, you know, settle on what you're going to do. That's essentially kind of the way it went last season. And obviously, I think the idea when they made the decision for Card was that Card was going to start all the way through, and it was just we're going to give Casey a chance to play. But then we saw what happened in Arkansas, and then everything flipped, and then Casey took over and then played really, really well those first few games and, and never really let go of the job. So I could see a scenario playing out similar to that, uh, but I will tell you from a physical talent standpoint, like I, both the guys are talented and Hudson's been in this offense now. So that helps. I just Hudson to me has to prove it on the field because I think we've seen what he can do in practice. And I think the coaches, the coaches gushed about him last year, all off season. And then it just went haywire and it wasn't just his fault. There, there was, there was line problems too, but he's got to prove it on the field. And then Quinn, we know the physical talent, like unbelievable, like, to me, when you look at ceiling for a downfield passing game of this sort, yours to me looks like the more attractive option just because of his ability. But he's got to learn the offense, and he essentially is really a true freshman. I mean, he yes, yeah. he was at Ohio State for a few months, but it was very hasty. You know, he took two snaps. It was he, he was never going to play, 
So he essentially is kind of a true freshman right now. This is the part where, where if Ari was here and, and he couldn't, he, he couldn't make the, the recording today, unfortunately, uh, where he'd be, how can they not start Quinn Ewers? <laughs> Don't they know he was a five star? <laughs> But I told I did tell Ari this. We talked. I think I did Stars Matter a couple weeks ago, and I told him I said I get it now after seeing Quinn in person. I totally get it. His ability is off the charts, and I and I get why he was number one in the country, and I get why people are enamored with his talent. And so, yeah, I think eventually, long term, he's the guy. And then, oh, by the way, if you, what happens if you land Arch Manning if you're Texas? Then what does that mean for 2023? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and that's that's another kind of welcome to the SEC moment where I feel like Texas is definitely in the in the Arch Manning sweepstakes. But then, if you're Sark, you're looking at, at pictures of Arch in Georgia in, in his Georgia uniform, and then in an Alabama uniform the following <laughs> week, and you're like, "Oh yeah, this is uh, this is what I'm up against every week now. This <laughs> that's is right. great. That's so, right. Yeah, this is this is going to be a fascinating year in the Big Twelve in general." just because Oklahoma is in so much flux, you know, it, this is a completely different Oklahoma program that, that they will see in Dallas, da- that Texas will see in Dallas, uh, Oklahoma state, that defense gets quite a bit younger. They lose the defensive coordinator to, to Ohio state. Uh, Baylor feels like the one that's kind of the, the consistent one now in the big 12, that if you're Texas, that's kind of the, you don't want to maybe not model after them, but, that's kind of what you aspire to be at the moment. You could do a lot worse than Baylor. One to two, get where three, you're going. Yeah. Six double digit win seasons since 2011 for Baylor. Three big wow. championships. Three different coaches. Three different coaches. And four and, different coaches if you count the the Jim Grove year. Right. And then they've been to two Big 12 title games in the last three years. So that that is a good program right now. And like I said, you look at the line of scrimmage they bring back, they've got changes. They've got, you know, Blake Shapin, new quarterback. They've, they've got to replace some receivers. Definitely got to replace Jalen Petrie, Terrell Bernard at, at, at the backer yeah. spots. But but they have talent, and they've done a good job recruiting. You got you saw how they lit up the combine and, and pro day mm-hmm. last yep. year. They've been recruiting a lot of big, long, fast guys for a few years now, and then have got some in the portal. You mentioned Ika, and they also got Jackson Player from Tulsa, who's gonna those two together in the middle. Whew, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a lot for for a well. That's that's what I wonder, and and it's hard with linemen because there's just not as many linemen in the portal. We've we've had this conversation on the show quite a bit about why that is, and I I, I don't know. Big I think big guys tend to be a little more loyal. It's just <laughs> just how it goes. <laughs> like we're they're they're lovable. They're they're used to being the fat kid. So if somebody shows them some love, they ain't leaving. That's um, right. But I think that's one of those things where you thought maybe Texas could could do some spot recruiting here and it just it it's not it's not even that that texas did anything wrong in that case just, there weren't a lot of game changers out there on the line of scrimmage in the transfer portal it's hard and, and i've talked to a lot of personnel people around here it's the, the the line is is if you're a lineman and you can walk and chew gum you're gonna get offers in the portal it, yeah. it's just it's just the talent in the portal at at, at o-line is just so hard to come by, and it's just not a, it's not as plentiful as your DBs or your receivers. There's a lot more of those guys to find in the portal than there are O linemen, and like you said, various reasons for that. So, it, yeah, I don't I don't necessarily fault Sark for not going to get a bunch of linemen in the portal because there aren't a bunch of great linemen to get in the portal. That you know, I think Baylor got one or two last year who did work out, but even then, you know, I was talking to Jeff Grimes last year. He was, we we thought they would fit and we thought they would do well, but it's you very much don't know until you get them out there. Yeah, you know. And whereas the, somebody the like Isaiah Nair D-line. in Wyoming, yeah, we know Isaiah Nair is explosive. We know what mm-hmm. he's probably going to do when he gets on the field. But when you're talking about an interior lineman or an offensive tackle, it's a whole different story, especially when you're yeah. changing leagues. Right, right. And the Ika thing at, at on the defensive side of the ball for Baylor, like you. Dave Aranda coached him and recruited him and, right. and knew that. So that's that's a little different when you got that relationship. And and here's the thing. For Sark, he knows Jaleel Billingsley. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jai Hall was came in after Sark had already left, but Sark was involved in the recruitment. Yeah, Jeff so, Banks was too, yeah. Yeah. So I mean they both they both knew him and and understood, you know, what his personality is like and what his skill set is like. So uh th- they have they have some knowledge there. Again, I'm not worried about if they can if they can give the quarterback some time. 
they're going they're going to move the ball defensively i do have uh, some questions because they have some depth on the d line nobody who knocks your socks off like nobody who you're looking at is kind of a top 3 round pick right now can they be good enough without stars because you saw oklahoma state defensively dominate the big 12 without a ton of just star power they just had a bunch of guys who were good at what they did who executed the scheme yeah, I think I think it's possible because I, they do have and, and they get a little the, the best players or the guys that that people seem to be most excited about, at least the teams that have played Texas are the younger the younger D linemen who they got back. Your your Byron Murphy, your Alfred Collins, your Vernon Broughtons, uh, you know, Coburn Ojemo, Tavondre Sweat, those guys are, are all back in their veterans, but those younger guys with another year under their belt and some you know, some more time with Bo Davis. If, if you can rotate those guys and they can play at a high level, you feel good. I think the big question with Texas is just how are they going to look at linebacker? I think that's where they really struggled last year. And, you know, DeMarvin Overshone is superbly talented and he flashed a lot, but there were times where, you know, missed assignments and, you know, they're going to have to get creative a little bit with him at times. Sark mentioned to me that they may put him on the edge at times now mm -hmm. that they brought in Tucker Dorsey as Tucker Dorsey will may, you know, obviously is going to take some reps at linebacker there. So, you know, they may be able to play more to overshone strengths in terms of his speed and explosiveness, have him come off the edge and come come after the passer. So uh, they've got to get better at, at linebacker. They've got, to, they've got to be able to just fit gaps better and just be more disciplined uh, to not let run spit like they had, you know, that Kennedy Brooks run that you saw at the end of Red River last year that won yeah. the game. Th those are the ones that kill him. Here's the thing. The other thing is tackling is – and I, I, I our lovely Jason Starrett, who is our stat guru at The Athletic, Look this up. They had 68 runs that allowed of at least 10 yards last season, which was 88th. But of those 68, 13 of them came after they hit the runner at or behind the line of scrimmage. Wow. And six of those, six of those where they hit the runner at or behind the line of scrimmage ended up touchdowns. Most touchdowns allowed in the FBS last year on runs that they hit the runner at or behind the line of scrimmage. That is crazy. So it's interesting because in, in your state of the program story, you talk to some opposing coaches who faced Texas last year. And one of the things one of them said uh, regarding their D line is, is those guys are, are talented, but are they going to be tough? Mm -hmm. And again, it comes back to the same question about Texas that we always have. Mm-hmm. And how do you fix that? Like, because Bo Davis, you look at the places he's been, he's coached some dominant defensive lines, mm -hmm. some great defensive linemen who are very tough. He seems like the kind of guy who can get that out of a, a player. But can can Texas players be that? I, I guess that's the question. Yeah, and that's puts when you we add that comment of are they going to be more tough, and square that with the audio clip that we heard of Bo Davis last fall. It makes mm -hmm. some sense. It makes, it makes a little sense. And so uh, that, that's one thing that Sark did say. He, he, he did, did feel that I guess after that, that there has been some more buy into Bo Davis from the guys that are there. And so obviously that's a wait and see thing. We have to wait and see, does it actually translate on the field? And is, is that actually going to be the case? If it is, then they got potential because Keandre Coburn, when he came out of high school, he was a four-star guy big time recruit out of Westfield and he it, during his career, he has had some, some really fine moments and has really played well last year. Didn't go as well, but if he can get back to the guy that he was, I think then, then yeah, you feel really good. If Byron Murphy can take that next step, uh, the DeSoto kid, he's superbly talented. Then, then you really, really feel good. I think about what you can do up front, but it's that whole front that has to work together. And the other question I have too, with this defense is, and it's a question everybody has, and, and Sark, you know, talked about a little bit is what impact is Gary Patterson going to have? You know, having yes. him around as a special assistant. Uh, obviously, he's you know he gets very low in those recruiting photo shoots. I, he's a <laughs> he's a knee bender, not a waist bender, that's for sure. Andy, I'm still I'm still having trouble getting used to seeing him in burnt orange. It's so it's weird. Cool. I went to the spring game and he's wearing the visor and the burnt orange polo, and you know he's been in purple for twenty four years and it's just so strange to see that it's it's just taking some getting used to but if anything I mean, was emblematic of, of texas's problems over the last decade it it was their record against tcu mm -hmm. like three so and seven if anything maybe he's the guy who can kind of self-scout them and and 
here's here's where you're messing up. Here's where mm-hmm. you're, what you're doing wrong. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it's worth a shot because it's got to be frustrating at this point. If you're the Texas administration, if you're the Texas fans, I'm wearing my my Pinkerton's barbecue hat in honor of one of my favorite Texas fans, Grant Pinkerton. There's a great place in Houston. They've got a place in San Antonio now. Uh, get the candy paint ribs. Yes. Tell, tell them Andy sent you. Get the uh, the duck sausage jambalaya. Oof. Tell them Andy sent you. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it has to just endlessly frustrate these people because you have everything. You have the location. You have one of the coolest cities in America. You have tradition. You have cool uniforms. You have every... Now, uh, listen, the away uniforms are a little, little stormtrooper-ish. And the icy as whites. We, <laughs> as, as we have noted on this podcast, the stormtroopers are the most incompetent military force in the history of cinema. <laughs> so maybe maybe that's why. Maybe maybe mix that up a little bit. I know that that would go against tradition. And frankly, I, I don't think... I don't I know. Like I don't know that I could I love see those it. uniforms. Texas but, a different uniform. It's, yeah. I don't know. But... But I just, I feel like something has to change. Maybe it's the conference affiliation that's the thing that had to change. I, I don't even know. But it is, something has to get done because there's no excuse for Texas to be sitting there at five and seven. There's no excuse for Texas to be losing to Kansas. They got to get it fixed at some point. So we will see if they can make some progress. But but Sam, I, I am very interested in this year because I feel like they took the right steps for the future. I'm not sure how much that helps right now. And can they be patient enough to get through right now to get to the future? That's the thing. And and I, I made this point as I wrapped it up. When you look at expectations for this year, I think the expectation start, needs to start with don't lose to Kansas. Don't lose to West Virginia. Don't lose to Iowa State. Yeah. Stop. Stop that. Let's let's start there. Let's not worry he, about he Alabama. Means in week that two. you are more talented than. Right. Let's not let's not worry about week two in Alabama. Nobody thinks they're going to win that game. And don't worry about that. Oklahoma's a rivalry game. So you never know with that one. You know how that is. But start with not losing those games. And I, I, I just marked 2022 as improvement as a must. I think they've got to be. I think an eight win season is a reasonable goal as a reasonable expectation when you look at what they've done with the roster. No, I, I'm not expecting them to contend for the big 12 title or be in the big 12 championship game, but if they go eight and four, that's progress. It's not what you want if you're Texas, but it's, it's what got to Tom they, Herman fired. And that's, that's the problem. That's where, that's where you're going to have some people push back on it, but I'm with you, but you've got to build it. And again, this is a long game because you're going to the sec. This is not, this is not a, we got to win the national title this year or anything like that. Like you You've got to prepare yourself for what's coming. And right. so you got to show incremental progress, in my opinion. To me, that starts just get on the other side of 500 this year. Let's just start with that. Yep. Get those get those young linemen. Don't don't throw them to the wolves. Don't kill their confidence, but but get them developed. Start start working toward them being the backbone of your program for the next three years. And that's that's all you can do. At also, this let's point. not let's not have a circus during the season. Let's not have no. you know Joshua Moore and Sark having it out at practice and leaving the team in the middle of the year. Let's not have you know Bo Davis video leaks you know, going on. Wait, although wait, I'm sure wait, 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 you haven't mentioned the monkey yet. You haven't mentioned the monkey yet. I haven't mentioned that. Let's let's avoid being in the headlines for things that are not football related. You know what I mean? Let's let, let let's. That's another thing to start with. Either that or get, completely embrace the monkey. <laughs> oh my goodness so if if just those two things don't lose to the teams that you're not supposed to lose to and just let's keep everything uneventful off the field this year you start there and then you can start building back up you, and then we can start talking about championship expectations later down the road. you have described the most boring season in texas football history <laughs> boring would be kind, good at texas it's the kind of boring everybody would take that's Sam so Con- that's Sam the kind Con- of boring they need. Sam Kahn Jr., let's all hope for boring. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Later.